Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Verbeest and I'm with MHLAC, the UNC team. I'm very excited by the brilliance that's in this room. And I'm also really honored to introduce you to our keynote speaker, um, Sabia Wade. So we have a mutual friend, Gretchen Bellamy, who emailed us and said, y'all need to connect. So we got on Zoom and the hour disappeared and I would just follow Sabia anywhere. Um, so there's a lot to talk about, as you'll see as I'm introducing her. So um, she is a black queer CEO, investor, author, educator, full spectrum doula, and expander of black luxury. So you can see why you could talk to Sabia for hours and hours and hours. She is the founder and CEO of Birthing Advocacy Doula Trainings for the Village and Loads of Pride Logistics. Her novel, Birthing Liberation, How Reproductive Justice Can Set Us Free, is now out and available for purchase. And as a side note, it's an excellent book. It's an excellent book. It's a really unique approach to this topic that creates space for feeling what we're reading, learning from a lot of different perspectives, and it offers a really hopeful vision for the future. And she did not pay me to say that. Um, and I believe we do have some for sale afterwards. So really encourage you to um, dive into that amazing work that is just newly birthed to the world. Um, she's dedicated to building bridges for a more inclusive, diverse, and equitable world through reproductive justice, distribution of financial wealth to BIPOC, BIPOC communities, and investing in emergent and innovative businesses. And I hope that you all will welcome her and take time to get to um, know her after the presentation. So I'm going to turn over to you. Thank you. Let's see, can you hear me? Oh, the mic is working. I'm about to do this. And so I decided to go for the wireless situation so I can show y'all how cute I am as I'm walking the front. But <laughs> how is everyone today? You good? So I'm going to let y'all know now that it's going to be adventure, a journey. I want people to come into this and then we're going to ask questions, we're going to talk collectively because you can't do collective liberation without the collective. So, <laughs> so I'm not going to just sit here and like scream at you about what I think. I want to hear your opinions, your thoughts, your experiences as well. Does that sound good? Okay. This is giving professional. So I'm Sylvia. Like we said, um, some of the more um, important things to me is that I'm a dog mom of two. Cairo and Cash are my heart. Cairo is six, he just turned six. Cash is one and a half. He's a mini dog, he's ridiculous. Um, and I'm also, I haven't put it on this slide and my baby mom's gonna like flip me out about it, but I'm a co-parent of two as well. So we have Jacob, who is five, 55, I'm not sure. And then we have Elijah, who is 11, 72. <laughs> Who are you, right? Like, what are, what are these kids? I don't, I don't get it. Um, for the people that are into like astrology, especially my queer folks in here, we'd be like, what? What's your sign? <laughs> I'm a double sash, Gemini, Moon. <laughs> I'm an INFJ. For people that are into that, period. Period. Okay. I'm an Enneagram Eight. Two? We love to. We love to. No, I think. Right there? My, wife, my mic isn't working? Oh, I can yell about the same. So here we are. Okay. Y'all wanna do this? Oh. So, so the next thing is for who are human design people. Can you wait? We're gonna get it together right here? Right here it's working? Okay. <laughs> do I need to take this one off? Okay. No? I'm good now? Okay. Um, and then do we have human design people? <laughs> With Davina. <laughs> I'm a manifesting generator. Anybody into that? If y'all not into that, we got it. Every time I turn here, I'm like, <laughs> So. Anyways, again, I am Davina. I'm a This mic don't like me. That's what the people said. Can you hear me now? <laughs> 
So let's move on. This is kind of the flow of what we're gonna do. What you want me to do? Y'all want me to yell? Okay. Yeah, let's see. Hello? Okay, I'll stay here for a minute. <laughs> how do I turn this one off? I don't know how technology works. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so this is going to be our kind of um, little flow to our time together. So we're going to do introduction and birth work. We're going to do equitable perinatal care, healthy community, liberation, personal, professional, and collective. And then if we have time, we'll do a little Q&A. So before we start, I'm also a big somatics person. So if anyone has not read my book, to let you know there are pauses with somatic breaks, right? Because I feel like in order for us to actually absorb, we have to integrate. And integration is not just a mind thing, it's a body thing, right? So we're actually gonna start off with a little pause, a little, a few breaths, so I know we don't have all day today. I feel like I can hang with y'all. Y'all already giving me energy. So, but we're gonna do a little pause for a little breath work for a minute. Just some deep breaths. But what I would like you to do is first, find some spaces in your body that you need to move. So maybe you need to stretch your neck. Maybe you need to roll your shoulders. Maybe you need to twist at the hip. Maybe you need to flex those feet forward and back. And then when you're ready, I want you to find some stillness. You can close your eyes if you like to. You can keep them open if you like, whatever works for you. And right now, I just want you to pay attention to the normal pace of your breath. Just feeling the way that your body moves as you breathe. Taking notice of any sensations that may be in your body. So any coolness, warmness, heaviness, lightness, whatever may be there. In this silence, you may also notice, especially if you're like me and a chronic pain person, this is also when I realize like the pain that may be present in my body that I haven't been really paying attention to. And just let that be without any judgment. And then to kind of end this space, I just want you to take deep breaths, three of them, in through your nose, out through your mouth, expanding your ribs as much as you can. So take a deep breath in, then releasing, another deep breath in, releasing, another deep breath in, releasing, allowing your shoulders to drop as much as you can, allowing your pelvic floor to open and, and be nice to you, unsqueezing your butt cheeks if you got that going on. Okay, and then when you're ready, come back to the space, look around, orient yourself. I don't even know what today's date is, so I couldn't tell you that. What is today's date? August 2nd, August 2nd. here we are, 2023, Minneapolis. <laughs> How are you feeling? <laughs> Was that good for you? Okay, because now it's time to get lit. Okay. <laughs> so the first question I have for you is, where does quality perinatal care begin? I just want you to come with some answers. You can raise your hand if you want, because I'll point to you. But where do you think quality perinatal care begins? At home? With yourself? Before pregnancy, reproductive education. Anyone else? At birth. Connection holding the space. Children's formative years. Any? Ooh, ancestry. Yes, girl. And when I say girl, that's a gender neutral girl. Just so y'all know. Um, I'm black. So when I say girl. <laughs> It's like, it's a you in that, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Grew up. Okay, so those are all good understandings of where perinatal health 
quality health begins, right? So one of the things we're going to move through is kind of like a chapter in my book um, that was really important for me to build and write about. So it's called Healthy Community, Healthy Parent, Healthy Baby, right? And the quote that's in the book is from Coretta Scott King. Um, and she says, the greatness of a community is most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members. Love Coretta, don't we? So we're going to get into it. Healthy community, healthy parent, healthy baby. So one of the things that have bothered me over time as a doula, um, just kind of give you a background to my doula journey. I started off as a prison birth project doula in 2015 in Massachusetts. So I worked with incarcerated, formerly incarcerated people actively using and recovery, so on and so forth. Right. And if you think about that, that community is like the community where people are like, this is terrible. This is bad. You're a bad person. This is this. Right. And it gets very complicated. And so one of the things as a doula is our first thing is to be non-judgmental. Now we're human. So judgment always pops up. Right. That's just a thing. But we also have to move into understanding not just the person in front of us, but what is the whole that is surrounding that complete person. Right. So when we think about that, I'm like. In that space, I would see a lot of blaming of the parent. Well, the parent isn't this, and this is why the baby has these issues. Or, And then because they're, they're creating these babies with issues, then that then impacts our community. And now the community is a terrible community, right? So the idea being that everything starts at the healthy parent. And I'm like, no, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. What do y'all think about that? No, not with it. So we're on the same page? Okay. And also, time, that's telling me 10, 20. That means I'm 10 minutes in. Like, oh, no, is that the time now? Okay, I'm done at 11. 11, 10, thank you. <laughs> so I want to think about this in a different way, right? My way of where does equitable perinatal care start from, it starts from a healthy community, right? If we have a healthy community that therefore creates a path for a parent to be healthy and therefore creates an even wider, bigger, abundant resource path to have a healthy baby. Does that make sense to y'all? So instead of this healthy parent, healthy baby, healthy community, where all the blame goes on a single person, right? We're now saying, let's widen the scope and understand what does a healthy community have to look like to create a healthy parent and therefore a healthy baby. And one of the things that I really appreciate about one of you that answered it was like, Equitable perinatal care starts before someone is pregnant, right? It starts before then. It's what's been one, it's their food, it's their the access that they have to transportation, it's their jobs, it's this, it's that, right? And then they become a parent, right? And then within that, can they actually have the space and the rest and the resource that they need to be a healthy parent physically, mentally, spiritually, so on and so forth? So we're going to get into a little bit of what does a healthy community consist of. So that's my question for you. What do you think a healthy community consists of? Freedom? Who said it? Freedom and free health care. <laughs> Baby, I can't even tell you the bill I just paid. This is not about me. Ooh, but when I swiped that, what did I say? I said $2,000. But I need, I need to know that my body's going to be okay, right? I need to figure out what's going on with me, right? So free help. Whew, yes. Amen. Who else has some ideas? Relationships. I love that. Can you speak to a little bit more about that? So relationships not only with your immediate family, but the Yes, relationships, healthy relationships in your community, right? Your immediate family, extended family, your neighbors, your this, your that, right? Love that. Thank you so much. Who else has a thought? Who? Who over here first? Access to healthcare, right? Like being able to actually literally physically even get to a space, right? There's been so many times where I see, um, when I was living in San Diego, there was a birth center, that was like, we we take Medicaid clients, we do this whole thing. But I was like, one, you're in a very privileged area 
there's no transportation there, right? So it might exist, but the access to it is hard to get, right? Who else had a thought? Availability of nutritious food. Yes, yes, yes. How many people are living in food deserts? A lot. Who has some other thoughts? Yes, respectful of your humanness. Another way to put that, I think, would be intersectionality, right? Being, like, aware of your whole self, right? I'm not just black. I'm a black, queer, non-binary woman. So what does that mean for me? Where do I come from, right? Like, we need to have the whole story and not people, not treat people like monoliths. Right here. Trusting the healthcare provider, so them earning the trust. Right? Absolutely. Here for that. Healthy land? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, yes. Like, especially when we're talking about, like, the land, the air pollution, things that people are consuming unknowingly on an everyday basis. Belonging. Yes. Having people in a space where you belong and not always feeling like the other. Hence why I moved from San Diego to Atlanta, because I was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, for my nervous system, literally for my nervous system, I need to see more representation of myself because I need to feel like I belong and not like people are like, why are you here? Inclusive and non-biased sex, edu sex education or education in general? Education, period. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't know why, like, I'm, like, infamous for being inclusive, and I'm, like, we all can just do this. Like, it's, it's not really a skill set, I would say. It's just a way of respecting everyone that's around. <laughs> so when we're talking about what a healthy community consists of, these are the things, right? So we're going to go through it kind of briefly, um, but quality health care. So patient-centered, culturally congruent medical and mental health care. Quality education, community-led, restorative justice practicing, trauma-informed education. What is trauma, and what does it mean to be trauma-informed? Empathy. Empathy, right? Empathy is number one. And it's also to, like, the thing about trauma-informed, I'll say this piece, I think is really important. One thing that we know is, like, everyone's not going to reveal every single trauma that they have ever experienced. But what if you just treat them as if they were a traumatized person, right? With kindness, with giving them the ability to lead the interaction, with building trust, right? Then after that, usually where you hear what maybe a person has been through, right? So trauma-informed care. The next thing, adequate employment and job opportunities. So equitable pay, reasonable commute, opportunities for advancement, and we know this current economy is not giving. Um, <laughs> the number four, safe and healthy physical environments. So complete with drinkable running water, electricity, so on and so forth. One of the first things that I learned actually um, when I first became a doula and I went to my first conference, um, we did a water ceremony from an indigenous community in the space. And I was thinking about, like, I was like, yeah, water is every Like, we literally need water to live. And there's so many people who have terrible water. And, like, how that impacts you and your body, but also the children that you birth. Right? Like, it keeps going. So, like, we need to have those things, basic needs. Public transportation. 24-7 access to affordable and safe transport that is accessible to people with disabilities. How many times we're like, can't get to point A because it's not running anymore. Can't get here because it doesn't have any accommodations for me. Right? We have to be able to get to where we're going because not everyone can afford a car. They're expensive. <sighs> I noticed that the other day when I was looking at cars. Okay. <laughs> Nutrition. <laughs> no more food deserts. Health education for the community. Right? And this is one that like was really important, I think, especially as a doula. Um, well, I give you two examples. So when I was working with incarcerated folks, of course, they have their list of food that they can get. Part of our job was to look at that list and look at like the nutritional things that we wanted them to get and say, hey, you can get this from the peanut butter and you can get this from this other option over here. 
right? To so actually help them understand where can you get your fiber? Because in the place that we're working in, they probably get one piece of fruit a day, if that. So everybody was constipated, <laughs> right? So we really had to have conversations of like, let's look at this list of food that you can buy. What can we get that has fiber in it? Right. So it's not only just having the food, but also being able to educate the community and meet them where they are. Right. Another thing that we also see in perinatal care is like this idea of like, OK, you eat this kind of food. Let's say you're from a different type of culture. That's not healthy. And it's like you don't even understand that food. <laughs> right. Like understand what's in it. Understand the way that is cooked, the way that is, is why it's there is, is significance. Right. So that's why the education is so important, not only for the consumer, but for the people doing the caregiving. Next thing, arts and culture. Community-led celebration of culture through the arts. We all need some light. <laughs> and art is light, right? The way that we move, the way that, whether we see images, drawings, all that is important to our well-being. Civic engagement. So community-led advocacy for change. Community-led. <laughs> like emphasizing that, right? Like being of the community, to change, to moderate, to, to modify anything that's going on in the community. And then lastly, recreation. So access to fun and affordable, healthy activities. How do y'all, what do y'all feel about this list? What do you feel like, if anything, is either standing out to you because it's missing in your community or something maybe you've never thought about over here? For sure, right? And that's why we're talking about community-led. And I think when we're talking about community-led, we're also talking about different age groups, right? Because someone who's 82 is going to have a different perspective than someone who is 17. But all those pers perspectives are important to building a community that is whole. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we have a whole conversation about that, but that's very important. Very much so. Thank you for that. Also, you look so cute. Okay. <laughs> the look is like the hair. We kind of like, Ooh. Period. okay. Anyone else who has some other thoughts? Yes. <laughs> so I'm like currently tra training to be a chaplain. And I'm currently building a spiritual tool model for doulas to like be able to assess spiritual needs of the clients that we work with in a full way because of that exact reason. So yes, I have a presentation coming up about that too if y'all want to come. Who else over there? Yes, access to choice. Yes, especially if you want to birth in a hospital, if you want to do a home birth, if you want to move in certain spaces, and also, also who's a provider? that you're working with, because that also makes a big difference. Thank you for that. Anyone over here? Anything standing out about these nine pillars? I just wanted to make sure, okay. So <laughs> child care, yes. Affordable, yeah. <laughs> Affordable child care, yes, very much so. People shouldn't have to make choices around do I work or do I stay at home? Because if I work, it basically eats up all my money and there's no, right? That's also not fair. I don't think that's fair for parents' mental health either, right? Like people want to work and have something that is outside of parenting that builds a healthy person, a healthy community. Yes, climate change. And I also think like when we're talking about the younger generations, they are doing that work and we have to listen to them. Right. And it's like I'm in this weird age where like I'm 34, so I'm not like 22 anymore. But I'm also like if I'm in a space where like 54 year olds are like, girl, 
But I'm like, <laughs> but I'm like, I'm, we have to get, listen to the youth, you know? But we do, for sure. <laughs> we auntie phase. Yeah, pre-auntie. But in my black luxury time, I'd be like, look my good auntie life. Okay. <laughs> So the thing I want to be clear about before we move forward is that personal liberation is a choice. Personal liberation is a choice. In this world that we're in, where there's so many laws, so many policies, so many people trying to police our bodies, so many people trying to tell us how to live, what to live, capitalism, so on and so forth, you have to choose every day to be free. Right? You have to choose that outside of these structures. You have to choose that in the ways that you move every day. Maybe that's your choice to move a little bit slower. Maybe that's your choice not to be in this space of urgency, right? Maybe it's your choice to eat food that really makes you happy. Maybe it's your choice to have a, a bigger body when they tell you that you're not supposed to, <laughs> right? Like whatever that is, personal liberation is a choice. So my question is, how many of you are choosing to be liberated? We got some work to do. How many of you are choosing to be liberated? Okay, okay, okay. How many of you are on a journey? Okay, okay. How many of you just like, I don't want to be liberated? <laughs> it's a choice. You can be like, listen, I'm, I'm good right here. Okay, no, okay. So personal liberation is a choice. Collective liberation is an intentional communal practice. So collective liberation is an intentional communal practice. We can choose to be liberated on our own, right? That's our own discretion, our own choice in the ways that we move, create, love, so on and so forth. But in order to really talk about collective liberation, we have to do it in community. Just like when we talk about healing, healing is not isolated, it's in community. Everything is in community. So that means that just like right now we're having these conversations, they have to happen with our community. If not, it just becomes more of a savior complex, isolated. It's about me. This is what I think is right. But it doesn't actually talk to the community and say, hey, what do we need to do? What are your gifts and talents? What are your challenges? What are you going through? How do I show up for you? How do you show up for me? How do we move, move towards the space of wanting equitable perinatal care? Because it can't be done by itself. And the next thing is quality perinatal care is not created or maintained in isolation. So what do I mean by that? One of the things that really grinds my gears <laughs> when we talk about perinatal care is like we talk about it like, you know how hospitals are broken into these like sections Here's the cardiac floor, and here's the, oh, the, the labor and delivery, and then here's this floor. And it's like, this is a, these are bodies. Bodies work together, right? The way our doctors try to say, like, well, your heart's not working, so it must be this thing. You're like, no, but that's connected to my lungs, right? And, like, that thing that's connected to my lungs could be connected to my mental health. It could be connected to my stomach. It could be connected to my blood. It could be connected to, right? So when we talk about quality perinatal health, it is not done in isolation, right? So what that means is that it's not just doulas who create the experience. It's not just midwives. It's not just doctors. But we are part of it together. It's also community members. It's also people who are not in the health space who are also creating this because they're creating a community. It's a civic engagement people, right? It's a, it's a librarian. <laughs> it's everyone. We are all creating quality perinatal, perinatal health care. Because we're aiming for collective liberation, and collective liberation will create quality perinatal health care. Does that make sense for everyone? So now we're going to kind of break down. I'm going to ask for some more participation. We're gonna, we might get a little deep, not too deep. You say what you want to say. You, don't, you know, if you feel a little vulnerable, you can be. But we're going to talk about a couple things to kind of put this whole message together. So one, before we start this, I just want you to take three deep breaths on your own. Maybe finding some movement in your arms, maybe shaking some things off. I'm a dancer, so I'll just be like, ooh, let's do this whole thing. 
But whatever you need to kind of move your body around, because I'm going to ask you some questions. And like I said, we might you might be surprised by your answers. You might feel a little, you know, alerted by what comes up for you. So the first thing we're going to focus on is our personal selves. Personal selves. So this is not who you are as a professional. This is not who you are, you know, as a parent. This is not who, this is you, yourself, right? And the main question I want to ask you is what needs healing? Take notice of whatever first thought came up in your mind. What needs healing? Mental health. Yes, <laughs> me too. Who else has some answers? What needs healing? Childhood trauma. Relationships. Insomnia. Racial distrust or distress? Distress, yes. My bad, Ooh. yes, yes. Birth trauma. Chronic illness. Yes, which is why I just spent all that money <laughs> the other day. Yes. Perinatal loss trauma. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Who else has some thoughts? What needs healing? Relationship with my mother. That mother wound. Something, ain't it? Who else has some thoughts? Grief. Anyone else? Self-talk. Self-love. Connection. Any other thoughts before we move on? Guilt. Friendships. Friendships are everything. Anyone else? Free yourself. Learning that everyone is human. Say that again. Resentment, yes. Resentment will eat away at you. And the other person will be fine. That'd be the part. You're like, I'm here. I'm tore up. And you were just living life. Great. Hierarchy of human value. Yes. Mm-hmm. Secondhand trauma, yes, that's secondary trauma. Woof. Viewing stuff and it becomes plastered in your body just like you were the one in that in that seat. Anyone else before we move on? Yes, working on decolonizing your body and yourself. Love that. What a journey that is, right? You're like, oh, I was doing this because of white supremacy. Huh. Didn't know. Political dysfunction. Mm. Anxiety. Whew, yes. I have, I have agoraphobia. So, like, me getting here was, like, a whole thing. Hustle culture. Finances. Filling your own cup. So just for a second, I just want y'all to sit and breathe with these responses. Sit with what comes up for you. If you if you feel the need to, write down some thoughts if that's available to you. It might be a list of things that feel like needs healing right now. And I also want to name that we all need healing in some way or another. There's no way that you can consistently move through this world and just be okay. And if you tell me that you're just okay, I'm not going to believe you. Sorry. 
Like, there's just no way. So I'm give you one more minute just for you to kind of think, sit, write, whatever works. And also while you are writing, thinking, sitting, I also want you to just pay attention to whatever sensations might be happening in your body. Some of you may notice, like, ooh, the heat got turned up. <laughs> right? Some of you may be like, my palms are sweating. Some of you may feel like my chest is heavy. Just take notice. And some of you may be like, I don't, I'm frozen. I was not ready for this question today. And just breathe through it. It's fine. No judgment. Just let it be. Are you ready for the next question? You're like, I don't know. <laughs> so now let's think about our professional selves. Right? So what type of professionals do I have in a space today? I'm a doula. Who, what else we have going on here? Maternal mental health. Who else is, what other professions we have in here? Pelvic health. OBGYN. Nurse. Lactation. Social worker. Policy advocate. Telehealth. Nutritionist. Academia. Oh, so we have people in here that can just change. We can get the answers right here together. Everybody's hitting everything. So I want you to think about in your professional spaces, what we're talking about, right? We talked about our personal selves, right? These things that we want to heal, these things that we know are present for us. How are those things impacting your professional self? Right? So if you're talking about having childhood trauma that needs healing, how is that impacting your professional self? So working with, so for you, childhood trauma was the thing that you're healing, right? And you're also choosing to work with people who are moving through childhood trauma themselves, for sure. How does that impact you? New realizations? For sure. So it's kind of cyclical in the way that it's moving. I love that. Mm-hmm. Perfect example, right? So the part that you were healing was that childhood part, right? Um, and then currently in your professional space as a management analyst, but working with, you've worked with children and families. Mm-hmm. And so in that space, you're aiming, because you weren't able to be your full self as a child, you're aiming to create that space for people to be their full selves as children and as adults, right? But also the other side of that is now you're putting yourself in overdrive, right? Because that healing part is screaming so loud that you're like, I got to do all the things, right? I have to fix it myself. I have to provide all the space, all the resource all the time, right? So there's a, the benefit of being in a space where you're helping your community, but it's also the thing that I need to work on, which is I'm putting myself in overdrive because of this trauma. Thank you for that. That was real honest and that was real. Anyone else? Imposter syndrome. Who said that? Hi. And so how is that impacting your professional space? Mm hmm And what's your profession again? Lactation. So the connection was in your personal self needing to heal imposter syndrome. And then in lactation, in your profession, you're like, I'm not, because I don't believe in my full self and my capabilities, I'm also not passing that along to my clients that I work with, right? I could be, if I believed in myself, I could be empowering them more. Right? I can be giving them more strength, more resource, more abundance, more whatever it is that they need. 
Very honest. Thank you. Anyone else? You, you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. And what, what do you do for work or professional, whatever? Got it. So you manage a maternal health grant. And with that comes hustle culture for sure. Right. But then what happens is like, even in your path to move things forward, right. With managing that grant, you're like, I'm, I'm never present. <laughs> I'm never present. I'm so dedicated on the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. I'm missing the things that are happening outside of that which is your presence, your day-to-day -day experience, your community, your people, right? Like there's a missing piece. So thank you for that. And that leads to burnout and just disconnection and sometimes resentment. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can really relate to that. So what was spoken was like that lack of experience of not having a, a child out of your body and then working in this space and being like, well, what am I, what am I doing here? So I'm a doula that does not have not birthed children and will not. Let's be clear. Okay. Will not. I think it's beautiful, but I don't, mm -mm, don't want to do that. But one of the things that I think that happens like in a very similar way, like in, in my doula journey, feeling that inadequacy, if you want to name it that. Um, and that was a part of me that needed healing in that space. And of course, it showed up in my professional space. So I'm like, who am I to give advice when I don't know exactly? But then I had to also understand that when we're talking about community and like what my patient was valuing or my client was valuing, it wasn't always a lived experience. Sometimes it was, you don't have a lived experience, so you're listening more than most people. Right, you don't, or like, especially when you have to get up in the middle of the night, you don't have children, so you can just get up and come, <laughs> right? Or because you don't have children, you're open to different types of parenting, you're open to different styles of doing things, you're open to creating it, right? Versus like having a very established way that you did things, right? But I understand definitely that in, that inadequacy that comes up and how that can um, impact the way that we work professionally. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So with the, like, racial distrust, right, which I think, like, especially as a black person, there's, like, I'm not Haitian necessarily, but I'm black, and, like, there is that understanding of, like, you don't trust white people, <laughs> right? Or you don't trust these people that don't come from the space that you're in. But the thing that, what that does, especially in a professional space, now you're just on guard all the time. Right. So you can't really hear because literally you're in like fight response. Right. You're ready to go all the time. You're ready. You're list, You're waiting to be offended. <laughs> right. So like where there's love pouring in, where there's care pouring in, where there's community pouring in, where there's pieces of collaboration that can be happening, you can't connect with it. Right. And like understanding that's a safety measure. Right. But also it kind of like builds this idea of like I can't trust anyone. Also, I can't trust myself. Right. And that in a professional space can be harmful. So like you said, healing through that allows you to see people as an individual and say, like, oh, I don't trust you because you did this thing. 
<laughs> right? And there was like this thing that happened versus like, because you are this one thing, I don't trust the whole, the whole community. Thank you for that. Anyone else? For sure. Mm -hmm. For sure. So it's this, because of being like lack of representation, right? Being one of few being a black OBGYN in the space where there's not many of you, now it's this drive in your professional space to over-represent, right? Which then leads to, to burnout, to overdrive, to resentment, to losing track of what, you, what really brought you into this work and why I really love to be here, right? And then you start to question, like, should I be here? Right? Because I'm so busy trying to represent, but I don't have the boundaries I need to understand what is my true capacity around this. And also the trust and the other OB, you know, OB black G GYNs that they're also doing their work, right? Even if I don't see it. So we're gonna move on. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the collective. So when we think about collective liberation, what does that include? And folks can just name what it includes. Who has some ideas? What does collective liberation include? What does it look like? Doing your own work. Wait, pause. Yeah. Doing your own work. Okay, continue. Exactly. Said a word there. So part of collective liberation is doing your own work, knowing who you are, investigating you before you come into a space looking to help others. I'm going to have y'all running. Oops. <laughs> Exactly. So acknowledging your history, acknowledging your privilege and utilizing that in the ways that is best for the community that is most impacted. Yep, this is a big wall, yep. right? We're just talking to nothing at that point. And when they're out the other, but the only thing that we hold on to is the fear, the mistrust, right? We don't hear the language of love. We don't hear the language of care, the language of community. We just hear the things that we're on guard to hear. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Open communication. Open 
invitation is important for sure. You could just yell. Yeah. <laughs> everyone feeling respected and everyone having agency. Thank you. For sure. Your liberation is my liberation. I'm not free until you are. Absolutely. Anyone else? What does collective liberation include? Asking people what they need, right? And understanding that they are the expert of themselves, right? Even if they have questions, right? We're here to help assist them to answer those questions, but we don't know more about them than they know, right? So making sure that we always make sure that transfer of power is always present. So I thought. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I think when we talk about allyship, right, and we talk about, like, our personal liberation, one, I think that a thing that's missing when we talk about li liberation is that it's not just an end point. You don't get there and then you're just there. It's a continuous journey, right? And on that continuous journey, it is also bringing people with you, right? Because your personal liberation can't be maintained unless other people are starting to join that, right? So it never stops, if that makes sense. And part of the not stopping is bringing the people with you and making sure that you're not coming from a place of hierarchy. Like, I'm liberated. Don't know about y'all. Like, you know, it has to be like, oh, this is the way that I move through my liberation practice, my liberation journey. How can I bring you along with me, even if it's in the smallest way possible? Right. So I think that maintaining liberation comes with, hey, let me hold your hand. Let's move on this together. Because I can't maintain it if you're not at least working on it. At that point, it becomes just self, a self prophecy kind of thing, right? A self, um, that's when you become narcissistic. <laughs> Anyone, last thoughts on this? What is collective liberation? What's included? Yes, so accepting our differences. And I think that's really important when we're talking about perinatal care. Right. Because we know that different families, especially if you do home visiting, different families have different types of systems and how they move. Right. Just because the baby doesn't know the language of English that you think they should know, they probably know a whole other language that you don't know. <laughs> right. Because that's what's important into their household. So how do we maintain that? Right. Like they may not be eating the food that you thought was good for them. They may be eating something that's a traditional food to their community that is just as healthy or healthier. Right. So how do we actually make sure we're doing the education to maintain that collective liberation? So on the ending note, I want you to just put these pieces together. When we talked about personal, professional and collective, that everything starts with you. If you are not doing your own work, we cannot create equitable perinatal care. Right. When we're talking about the community, the community is made of people. Right. We all have to be doing our own work all the time. This is layered. We cannot build collective liberation and talk about what we want for over there or those people or that community. We are the community. Are we doing our own work? Like my good sister said over there. <laughs> right. Like it starts with our own work. So just to kind of go back before my time is up. <laughs> Again, healthy community starts with us. We have to do our own work. In order to get to these points and being able to have these types of resources, we have to be able to sit in community like this and say, hey, what are your needs? What are your needs? They're different from mine. What is the resource that you have? What is the privilege that you have? Because at the end of the day, all of this is going to impact the children that we have and the children that are growing up and the children that we're going to continue to have in the future. So on the last note, personal liberation is a choice that I hope you make. I really hope you make it. 
right? And that doesn't mean that you're going to have tomorrow, you're going to be liberated because you made a choice. But I hope that you make <laughs> the choice to be on the journey, right? Starting with little things, the way that you deconstruct, the way that you move every day, the way that you deconstruct hustle culture, the way that you deconstruct your traumas, the way that you deconstruct the ways that you show up and the ways that you don't show up. Collective liberation is an intentional communal practice. We cannot do this without each other. We just can't, even if you don't like each other. It just, right? And when we talk about reproductive justice, I'm not talking about justice just for the people that I like. I'm talking about justice for the people that don't even know they're not free. <laughs> right? So we have to always understand that our fight is not just for the fight that for the people that we love and our community that say yes to us. Part of our personal liberation is moving through trauma and understanding nuance, right? And understanding that somebody is not going to know that they're not there yet. Somebody, but through your example, they can get there. Not because not you said so, not, they're going to move at their own pace, but you have to be the example of what you want to see, right? And the last, but definitely not least, because of all of that, Quality perinatal care is not created or maintained in isolation. It is a collective journey. Is it a collective responsibility? And lastly, you are not free until I'm free, and I'm not free until you are. Thank you.